morning. You guys are going to have to speak up and make some more some more noise. There's not enough here to fill in the holes. But I'm glad to see all of you that are here. I know this is 4th of July, and I don't know, remember the last time 4th of July landed on a Sunday. It's been a while. Um, so that's probably the reason we're missing a lot of people. I do hope there's not people missing because of sickness. I hope we're past that. But um, I'm glad we can worship the Lord here in our church on Independence Day. And I'll speak more about independence later on. Let's start the service with a word of prayer um, and invite the Lord to come to be with us this morning. Lord, thank you that we can be here. We thank you for the freedom that we celebrate today. And we thank you for the sacrifices paid that we can enjoy this freedom. Would you please give us a good service? Or would you help us draw close to you? Help us to want to be in your presence and invite you here. And I pray that you give us a good service and just help us to listen to your voice. Amen. Grab a hymnal and let's sing. Take the red hymnal and turn to number 646. 646.
Nothing is going to be able to stop the power of our God. He's going to move his agenda forward. He's going to get his will accomplished. And no matter what happens, he will prevail. Anyone have a praise you'd like to share? I started to share this Wednesday night, but I'll share it again tonight. I just feel very blessed from the Sunday night service. Like, just such a blessing. And I shared Sunday. I almost have sympathy for those who couldn't make Sunday night. I know schedules and everything else, but I mean, just the sharing and everything that we uh, could talk about Sunday night, such a blessing. I just encourage anybody, if your schedule permits, be there. Great time. And Wednesday night as well. Nice to have a good advertisement for those those events. <laughs> I didn't pay him anything to say that either. <laughs> I can't be blind if you want to like give me a or something. <laughs> Back to him now. <laughs> I really enjoy our times together. Sunday evening focus group just enjoy our discussion and fellowship anybody else do you want to get out early or have nothing on your mind this week well we have blueberries some people know that but while I'm picking blueberries I listen to music (laughs) And this week, um, yesterday, a song came on, and the uh, first two phrases of the chorus are, um, God is, God's been good in my life, I'm blessed beyond all measure. And that song just keeps going through my head, and I just want to thank him for all the blessings that he's given of me. You know how easy it is to forget about our blessings when we're going through something? Really easy. Spoken from experience. When someone says a long time ago here at Montgomery, I think 60, 70 years. <laughs> Brooks, just, Brooks just doing a couple months. <laughs> Anybody else? Doug? I had a, got a little bit of a story, but praise and prayer request kind of at the same time. Um, three weeks ago, I was out in California and Try to get a lot more exercise. So the one day I went to the beach, got a bike, rode a bike, walked like walked like six miles, rode a bike ten miles. The next day I went up to a lake, and got a kayak, and was kayaking and going great. All of some other people who tried to not be by myself and stopped for a minute to take a video, and the other people were kind of in front of me and moved on. All of a sudden, something happened where the kayak just capsized. And I was all alone to look around. There was nobody around me. And my life vest pulled up on me to the point where it was literally choking me. So I was I was in a world where I looked over to the edge, and I was what I thought was too far away to get there. And for several minutes there, I thought I was done. Um, tried to flip the kayak back over. was holding on to the kayak, trying to paddle and Pulling the kayak and realized that wasn't going to work. So then I made the decision to let the kayak go, which <laughs> watching the kayak float away was not a good, not a good feeling. Um, but uh, started trying to float and swim to the edge and was in that kind of almost panic mode, but trying to relax at the same time to not panic. But uh, I yelled out for help. Like I said, I couldn't see anybody. Finally, I started making some headway and getting towards the shore, and I thought there was an outside chance I could get there, and I looked up and I seen a boat coming. And uh, by the time they got to me, I was to where I thought I could get there any 
anyway, but uh, they kind of drove up and just pushed the kayak with their waves into the, to the shore. And I got in. I was very thankful because for a few minutes there, I wasn't sure what was going to happen. But uh, then a week later, one of my site managers here in Greencastle was on vacation, and he had gone kayaking through the day. And at night, they were they were late. Uh, towards the evening, he was with his son and his wife and said something to his son, I bet I could swim across the lake. And he started to swim across the lake and something in his body was, I don't know if he had a heart attack or what, but he ended up drowning. Wow. Um, and uh, you know, looking back to what happened to me the week before and then seeing that, like, I could see God's protection in hand you know, over me. And just very thankful for her, his protection getting me to the, to the shore. But uh, I pray for uh, a man's name is David Rowland. Um, I pray for his family. His 14 year old son saw it happen, and you know, his wife tried to get to him, couldn't get they, they had kayaks that were tied up. She couldn't get the kayaks untied and tried to get out to him, and they didn't find him until the next morning. So it's a very, very sad situation. Oh. But, uh, but yeah, just pray for the family there. Yeah, it makes you makes you think when that happened. That's for sure. I'm curious. You didn't attempt to walk on water. That could have been like Peter, maybe. <laughs> yeah, there's some things is enjoy the beauty of what's around you, and you never know what could what could happen. But you never know when when we're spared from something. We sometimes don't even have a clue about it. And the Lord has spared us, and we don't even know what happened. Anybody else? Keep remembering Levy's in prayer. And uh, Linda is still in the hospital. She was not able to go to her sister's funeral. We did, uh, or I should say they did, a Facebook Messenger video chat to have her part of the funeral. And uh, just keep praying for them. Keep praying for Susie. She has her doctor's appointment. Two weeks, I think. Keep praying for Judy, Royce, and Robert's sister. Anyone else? Any other prayer requests? Could be appropriate to pray for our country. I mentioned in Sunday school. Uh, you remember Martha in prayer. She had a drug reaction, apparently. And so she's uh, dealing with that. So is that the situation? Okay. Well, no, no, no. 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 Okay. She had, okay. Yeah. Probably if we're all honest, we have one of those on our hearts. All right. Let's go to prayer. Join me, please. Lord, we thank you for this day that we're celebrating. We praise you that you have given us the blessing of living in a free country. We praise you for the freedoms that we enjoy and the wonderful land that we live in. Yet, along with saying that, we have a lot of burdens and concerns and fears, even, of where our nation's heading. And we know that you have everything under control, and you have a plan, and you know what's happening. But would you help us as Christians to be the difference that we need to see in the world around us? We can pray for people to change their hearts, and we can pray for government to see the light and to follow you, but Ultimately, it's up to the Christians to be the testimony and the, and the example that we need to be. And I pray that you'll help each one of us determine in our hearts that we'll do that. Help our leaders somehow to see that you are the only answer to this, this problem that this world is facing. And I pray that you help 
them to turn back to you in some way, somehow. Would you be with the people here in our congregation that have been struggling and continue to struggle? And think of those that are at home. We think of uh, Tim and Glenda, Val and Darlene. It's good to see them earlier. Uh, think of Peggy. Think of Jack Horner. Think of Susie and Steve this morning. Would you be with them? Work a miracle in their lives. Encourage them both. Strengthen them. We think of Danny Myers and the struggle that he's going through. Be with the family and strengthen them. Be with Monica's nephew, Brett, as he's but struggling seriously. Would you help them and uh, help them to see how much you care about them? Be with Judy as she's not doing well at all and help the family give them strength. And give a special touch of encouragement to them. Continue to be with Claire as he's struggling physically. Would you give him a physical touch? Think of this family that lost their father and loved one in this tragic accident. Would you be with them? Maybe if Doug had an opportunity to have the words to say that could, could uh, be a witness for you through this situation. Think of the Levies as they're struggling with the loss of Linda's sister, as Linda is also still struggling physically, and just a lot that they're dealing with. Would you give them a special touch? Be with Martha as she is having some issues. Um, and we pray that just give her a special touch and blessing. And thank you so much for her testimony and her life that she's lived for you. Be with those that have burdens on their hearts, as Ben mentioned, has one. And I know there's others that just weigh heavy, but sometimes we're not able to share. Would you just give a special answer, a special touch, help them to feel Help us all to feel how much you really care about our situations, no matter how big or how small. We praise you, Lord, for our church, you know, for our family, for our friends. Would you help each one of us to be the, the witnesses, the encouragement to each other, the, the blessing we need to be to strengthen each other and encourage each other in their walk with you. We thank you and we praise you in your name. Amen. All right, let's remember no church this evening. As far as I know, at this point, we're going to do our focus groups next Sunday night, unless something would change. Um, I don't see many young adults here. I think Brandon already left, so we'll just leave that one. Um, July 24th is our VBS activity day, our fun day, and I encourage you to uh, seek out somebody on the committee if you have availability that day to help out. July 25th. Next morning is going to be our Sunday school promo, like we were going to do several Sundays ago. And uh, we're going to try to see if we can get that accomplished this time. That's from 9.15 to 9.45. July 17th. I write that date down now. Right. 17th. The 16th, I think. Anyway, the Sunday school picnic. Um, and there's a sign-up paper in the back, so I encourage you to sign up for that so we know how many people are coming. Also, Jack Noel wanted me to say that he is going to be with the Gospel Springs. Springs. <laughs> Strings. There's probably a spring at Twin Bridges. That's probably where it came from. Um, he's going to be with the Gospel Springs at, at Twin Bridges at 2 o'clock this afternoon. So if you want to come and support, go and support that. Uh, and then also an update from our Sunday School elections. Basically, it was all confirmation. Um, our committee now is Ben Kennedy uh, and Jason Ocker as a su superintendent and assistant, Diana and Jessica as junior department superintendent and assistant, and the members at large are Helen Harbaugh, Brooke Helfrick, and Adeline Levy. That's all announcements I have, unless I missed something. I'll have another song, and then I'll share with you what I have for this morning. Hey, turn with me now with, in your blue books this morning. I'm going to throw you a curve. Put the dust off of it and turn to number 440. 440.
That was a very fitting song to go along with the message. If I was to start reading, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them to one another, <clears throat> or we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable, yeah, unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You recognize those words? Signed nearly 250 years ago on this day. And we celebrate Independence Day today, July 4th, 2021, exactly 245 years past that special day in our nation's history. And coming up on July 4th has caused my mind to kind of swirl. And I'm not sure if I can get out correctly what's been on my mind, but I'm going to try. On this day, every patriotic and honestly even non-patriotic people celebrate to some extent. I mean, even if you're not patriotic, you still enjoy fireworks, I think. It's definitely a national holiday, not a Christian holiday, like Easter or Christmas. I love national holidays. I think that they're fun. They're, they're, we can enjoy patriotic things like flying flags and, and seeing fireworks and family picnics and that kind of thing. But as we celebrate this day, I can't help but think about how we have this holiday mixed up. We focus on political and national independence, and I really question how free are we really? Are we really a free people anymore as Americans? Now before you get upset with where I'm heading with this, I still strongly believe that we live in the best country and I'm proud to be an American. I still am. There's some things I'm not very proud of, but I'm still proud to be an American. But I see today our freedom being eroded and it begs the question, why? I want to share a couple of quotes and, and uh, snippets from, for you and just I'll tell you where they came from after I'm done reading them. It cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians. Not on religions, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Does anybody know who said that? Give me liberty or give me death. Patrick Henry said that, right? Let's say, I'm just about, I thought I'd just about embarrassed myself on that one. <laughs> Do you think this country might have strayed from that? Just, just a little? Here's another one. Everyone appointed to public office must say, I do profess faith in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ, his only Son, and in the Holy Ghost, one God, and blessed forevermore. And I do acknowledge the Holy Scripture of the Old and New Testament to be given by divine inspiration. That is the Delaware Constitution from 1776. <laughs> is there a possibility that that's not practiced today? A little bit of sarcasm there because it's pretty evident it's not. So as I approach this day, I wonder, have we as a nation placed too much value on political independence instead of spiritual independence? Spiritual freedom was one of the main reasons why people came into this country to begin with, right? Isn't that the most important? I feel because... That because our attention as a nation has swayed from placing God first, then the result is our political freedoms are at stake. So this morning, instead of your typical 4th of July sermon that tells about our country and the wonders of it and how it's slipping and how we need to turn back to God and all this and how we can fix it, I want to focus on the core problem, and that is sin. How to gain spiritual independence. 
from Satan. Turn your Bibles with me to John chapter 8. John chapter 8, and we're going to start with verse 31. I would imagine that some of you could quote several of these verses. John 8, 31 to 36. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Most assuredly I say to you, Whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Pretty familiar words. But I want to examine them this morning and see if we can gain some encouragement in the fact that we can have freedom from sin. And I also want to throw in some connections to our political scene and the downward slide that we see America in right now. So just keep your Bibles open. We're going to walk through this passage together this morning. Let's start by asking the question, who is a follower of Christ? It's important to start to make this very clear. What makes a person a follower of Jesus Christ? Jesus says here that the main main criterion for being one of his disciples, uh, he tells us what was the main criterion, and, and we need to ask ourselves a question: What are we most focused on? National freedom? Don't get me wrong here. It's good to be concerned about it, and it it's necessary to pray about it. But are we more concerned about our national freedoms? than we are in our relationship and freedoms in Jesus Christ. He says in verse 31, look back there again, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And depending on what version you're reading, that word abide could be continue in my word, or dwell, or remain. If a person abides in a house, they live there. It's where they spend most of their time. It's familiar. It's home. That's what Jesus is saying. You need to live your life in my word. Make your home there. Right? Stay there. Our watchword and song as Christians should be to follow the words of our Savior as we read it in Scripture. And that should be our first goal. If we're to accomplish anything else in life with any merit or success, it needs to be done by following the directions Jesus outlined for us in Scripture. We need to switch this off, Daryl. I'm getting popping up here or something. I don't know if the batteries are bad or not. Change this. Yeah. <clears throat> so think about that for a minute. Make your home. In Jesus' word, live there, abide there. Do you think it could be possible that our country would be in a different place if our leaders would decide they want to be a disciple of Christ? Where are the majority, and I say that carefully because I know there are some true Christians in government, but where are the majority of our leaders abiding right now? And I feel, for the most part, most of our leaders are seeking their own good, their own gain. They're not looking out for the good of others. They're not looking how to please God. And what would happen if they would choose to go back to the desires that our founding fathers had? What about each one of us? Have you considered where you're abiding? Are you abiding in the place where self is pleased and you aren't giving everything to Christ? Or... Are you abiding? Are you living in his word? Are you obeying his directions as presented in the Bible? 
For me, even though I'm happy and proud to be living in America, and I consider myself a very blessed American citizen, I really do, my allegiance to Jesus should be way more important than my allegiance to any country. So let's be sure that we place the priorities where they belong in the proper order and abide in his word. Then Jesus uh, stated something that <clears throat> is becoming more and more real as time goes on, as, as technology increases, and that is knowing the truth. Look at verse 32 again. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And I trust you don't think me a broken record, but this is a subject that has concerned me greatly over the past nearly two years. This word truth has caused me great concern. The internet with all the social media and the information outlets has caused us to be incredibly prevalent right now. And I'll give you an example. And follow along with me here because I try to understand the heart of what I'm saying. I look on Facebook and I read a post that really has nothing to do with scripture. It has nothing to do with spiritual things. And someone makes a comment. Um, and then all of a sudden there's a bunch of comments after. That's the truth. Speak it. Preach. You know, all of those now, I understand it's a statement like, it's probably not thought through as deeply as what I am right now, thinking through it. In other words, they're saying, you're not lying. That's accurate, you know. But truth is, the word truth is thrown around so frivolously today. But there are also times when people are sharing things that are not <laughs> scriptural, but it sure sounds like it could be. And I shared this last week. I've had people tell me things. That sounds so very pious, and they sound spiritual, but it's not lining up with Scripture. Maybe you know what I mean, or it's happened to you, but someone states to you that they feel like they need to speak truth into your life. Have you ever had that happen? The attitude that comes across is that they know they are right, you are wrong, and they are the ones decreed by God to shake you up. Well, they may not be lying. They may genuinely think they are. They may generally think they do have a big job to do. But their truth that they're sharing, is it their truth or is it God's truth? Now turn it around. Have you ever been in a position where you felt like you had a handle on the truth and you desperately needed to tell someone about it? Well, first grade it against Scripture. Does it line up? If so, then ask the Lord, is that something you want me to say? Like I heard recently, not every teachable moment is your moment to teach. And I'm adopting that as one of my catchphrases. <laughs> but if it doesn't line up with God's word, then maybe zip the lip. <clears throat> I don't know if you've heard the saying, if only closed minds came with closed mouths. So what is the truth? Looking back again at the truth spoken about in verse 32, this truth is the gospel of Jesus Christ. I realize that one can tell the truth, they can tell something truthfully and not be lying, and it still not be the truth. There is only one truth, and that is the truth that Jesus came to save from sin and provide an eternity spent in heaven. Therefore, if we want to truly make a difference in the world, we need to latch onto that truth so hard and share it with others. If we base our interactions against how, how this is affecting our sharing the truth, then it will greatly affect what we say and do. For example, the truth, our truth, that we desperately need to share with someone and we think <clears throat> we need to tell them, is that helping them towards Christ? Is it leading them towards Christ? Or is it only serving as a distraction and discouragement? And what I'm finding is that when someone desperately needs, feels like they need to share the truth with someone, it's usually because the thing they feel so strongly about, they feel is being threatened. The truth of Jesus Christ doesn't need defended. It will last forever because Jesus created it. Therefore, know the truth. Help others to know the truth. Help them to be set free from Satan and his power. That is real independence. And then there are those, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> in this passage that had an abundance of pride. <clears throat> I'll explain what I mean here as we 
Look again at verse 33. So they answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? So when you read it that way, doesn't it put a different emphasis on it? Like, how dare you say we're not free? Some of those Jews that Jesus was speaking to got indignant by his statement. And obviously, there were some there that believed him and some there that struggled. It doesn't clearly state that everybody there believed him, even though at the beginning it says he was talking to those that believed him. But these Jews were of the seed of Abraham. So they viewed themselves as having special freedom because of their race. The pride in the Jewish nation um, came out pretty strongly there. It's interesting that these people obviously weren't thinking about their ancestors, like the bondage in Egypt or, or the captivity in Babylon. They just suddenly became unglued because you're saying we're not free, and we are. Their nationality, call it patriotic pride, really got in the way of what they were hearing from Jesus, and, and, it, and it affected them. We as Americans can be very proud people. Or should I say we as Americans are very proud people. We view ourselves as better than everyone else because we live in the USA and the best country in the world. But I think it may be surprising to some to find out that we may not, in some ways, no longer be the greatest country in the world. And I was made aware of that, I think it was back in 2009, 2010, and I never, I never thought about it up until this point, but all, this, all the countries have their credit rating with whoever they're, I don't know, stacked up against, I don't know. But America always had the best credit rating, or at least the best one, not that other countries didn't, but Triple A Plus, I think it was it was. And back then they lost one of their they lost the plus. And I'm not even sure they may even lost one of the A's now. Even financially we're not the best country in the world anymore. I'm not sure how to word this, but I'm going to try to put my thoughts together here. The freedom we may experience as Americans and the freedom that we experience through Jesus Christ are vastly different things. However, I think many times we as American Christians can get so distracted with our national freedoms that we forget to focus on our spiritual freedoms. Day by day, it seems like one more liberty is being stripped away. We no longer have prayer in school, and that's been a long time ago. Under God is something we've been fighting to take out of the Pledge of Allegiance. And we're not supposed to share our personal spiritual beliefs with anyone because it's intolerant or, or it's biased. And I hear over and over again, we're losing our freedoms. Our freedoms are at risk. And believe me, I, I agree. There's no doubt. It, it's happening. However, I wonder if somehow we forget that we still possess, without any restrictions, complete freedom that no government leader can ever take away. If you are a Christian... No governing authority can take away the freedom you have in Jesus Christ. And that's freedom that is not compared with any other type of freedom in this world. And I don't mean that we shouldn't stand up for our spiritual and religious freedoms. But I do encourage each one of you that the freedom in Jesus Christ goes far beyond any freedom offered by any country. It's eternal. It'll last forever if we stay close to him. So don't allow pride in our country to distract us from the freedom we possess in Jesus Christ. It's okay to be a proud American. That's fine. But let's remember the freedom we have in Jesus Christ. That's something to be rejoicing in. But then, who is in bondage? Jesus answers this question in verse 34. He says, most assuredly, whoever commits a sin, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And Jesus gives a pretty straightforward description here of who is in bondage. It's someone who's sinning. And I want to make something perfectly clear here. This phrase, commits sin, doesn't mean a person who makes a mistake and stumbles and commits a sin. This is referring to someone who is intentionally, habitually committing and living in a lifestyle of sin. This is referring to someone that's not even attempting to make a change. It's a lack of concern, a lack of even trying. And don't get me wrong, we as Christians can and should live a life free from sin. And I'm going to at some point preach on that. But know that we will occasionally make mistakes. The unfortunate sad fact is we're humans and we're going to trip and fall every once in a while. 
But if you're simply living your life without a care in the world about your conduct and, and, and you're purposely engaging in things that do, do not please God, then you are a slave to sin. God knows your heart and whether you're trying or not. Only he knows. So he knows if you desire to be his child or a child of Satan and sin. Then Jesus goes on a little bit farther to explain, are you slave or are you family? Reading verse 35, and a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. In those days, and even in years following, slaves usually had separate quarters. They didn't, you know, they might have worked and, and in the home all day long, but come evening time, they went to their own quarters. Uh, that was just how it worked. They weren't part of the family. There was also the potential if something happened and the slave did something the master didn't like, or they wanted someone that did better work, you know, they could sell them off and buy someone else. That's just how that worked. And Jesus is giving the comparison between actual heirs and slaves. An heir is promised that they can live in the home as long as they choose and enjoy the blessing of being a part of the family. A slave, on the other hand, has none of his privileges. And Jesus has a reason for using the term slave to sin because he immediately explained what a slave in real life is compared to a person enslaved in sin. And if you are enslaved in a lifestyle of sin and have no desire to serve the Lord and please him, then you will not have the blessing of freedom from sin nor the promise of eternal freedom and the internal inheritance with Jesus Christ in heaven. Jesus calls us to be his family. He wants us to be his sons and daughters if we accept his gift. And as I said before, I'm proud to be an American. I am more thrilled that I can have freedom in Jesus Christ. Though. I can abide in heaven forever knowing that freedom. But then, last, Jesus shares what is true independence. So who is free? Who then has true independence? Jesus tells us in verse 36. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. And I want to draw your attention to something here. If you notice the word son in verse 36 is capitalized, while the previous verse son is not. And you obviously all know this, but verse 36 is talking is not talking about the son is born into a family, but the one and only true son of God. And if you've accepted the gift of eternal life from Jesus Christ, God's son, then you will be free. Free from the terror of eternal separation from Jesus. Free from the threat of hell. Free, free from Satan and his power. That's freedom. Really, truly freedom. So if you've accepted Christ as your Savior, you'll, you'll have the glorious knowledge that even if you feel like your freedoms are being taken away here on earth, nothing can take away your freedom in him. Romans 8, 38 and 39. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. Neither height, nor depth, nor any other created thing. Because Paul just kind of got tired of listing everything, so he just said every other thing. Shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I get it. Sometimes it's discouraging. Sometimes it's scary to see what's happening in our country. But as Christians... We can have the assurance that the Son has given us true independence. We can truly be free through Him. Now, I love the fact that we live in a free country, but the question I have is this. What happens if we lose all of it? Would your world fall apart? Or would you still realize that I am free with a freedom that nobody can take away? No government or world leader can strip that from me. Freedom from sin is a freedom that I don't want to lose at any cost. There's many symbols in our country that represent our freedom in America, and they're beautiful ones. I love seeing a billowing flag. It's just, it does something for me. I love seeing an eagle. That's, that's a beautiful sight. And I love the Statue of Liberty. It's another symbol. But as Christians, there is a symbol that is far greater than any American symbol. <clears throat> And that's the symbol of the cross. And it's through that cross that we have true liberty. 
Daryl's going to play a song. I'm sure you know it, but if you haven't, just listen close to the words. It is recorded that Christ has set you free. Therefore, stand firm in the Lord. tell someone I'm an American. Now think about how proud you are to tell someone I'm a Christian. Which one fills you, now I think there's different types of pride, but which one fills you with greater joy and greater, greater pleasure? We shouldn't be ashamed of the gospel. We should share it. Let's share the cross. Let's share that liberty with others. That's true independence. I trust you have a wonderful Independence Day today, but more than thinking about our, our, our national freedom, think about the spiritual freedom we have in Christ. Let's pray.
Lord, thank you for the beautiful promise that you have given us in the cross. Thank you for the independence we can have from Satan and sin. And would you help us to focus on that? When other things seem to be falling apart, help us to remember that we have freedom in you through your work on the cross. And we thank you and praise you. Give everyone a good day traveling and safety and all that goes with it. In your name, amen. Thank you.